Thank you for very much helping with that. Uh, and then watch this pivot. Uh, the mission of our church to live God's love beyond ourselves is also impossible without community, what we're talking about today. Now that's what we're going to be, that, that's going to be the, the thesis I'm going to be kind of working from. I think that's my first slide. Let me uh, see if I can figure this out for you guys. Uh, the mission is impossible without community. Uh, what is community? We're going to take a look at what that looks like, but why is this true? Why is this, this mission impossible without community? Because, on, on, I mean, you get it, a church. A church isn't a church without more than one person, right? But, but our mission statement, to live God's love beyond ourselves, that's very individualistic, right? If I just tell you, live God's love beyond yourself, you say, okay, I will. Why do we need community? Well, that, that's why I think this sermon is really important, uh, because it, we absolutely need community. To start off, we're going to go all the way back uh, to the beginning. So even, not, not even Genesis, like before Genesis, right? Before the creation of the world, the only thing that pre-existed before time itself was God. So our, uh, our beliefs in line with Orthodox Christian beliefs is that God has eternally existed. So before there was any such thing as time, there's God, and then he creates time. He creates the world. He creates us. And this is what we say in our beliefs document. It's online if you're interested in, under the about section. Uh, this is about in the section about God. We believe that there is one God who is a unity of three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been and will forever be the same consistent entity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally exist in a relationship of self-giving love with one another. So this is how we have chosen to describe this very uh, abstract concept of a Trinitarian God. Core to the Christian faith is that our God is actually three persons that are a unified whole. So they're three, and yet they're one. Uh, there's n- really nothing in the world that we can point to and say, oh, it's just like that. But it's absolutely crucial to the doctrine of the church. Why? Because what holds together these three persons God the Father, God the Son, that's Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, is this self-giving love. Love has to have an other in, in itself. I was, um, our son takes piano lessons, and uh, I go there, I drop them off, and they go off to another room where the piano is, and I just sit in their living room, um, and it's funny, they're, um, they kind of make way for me, like, like so like uh, her husband's like upstairs, and, and he like doesn't show his face, so I just kind of sit there in the main floor, they're in like the basement, Whoever else is in the home is upstairs. And it's, it's really relaxing. I can't do anything else. Um, you know, like I don't have their Wi-Fi code or anything. And so I usually bring a book and just try to read and relax. Well, the other day I was like looking. I look around their home all the time. So, you know, it's like there's nothing else to do. Uh, but, but there was a, a cross-stitch pattern that was being worked on. And I was trying to look at it because it's like in cursive. It was like in a script. You know, I'm kind of like, what does it say? And I thought it said, um, isn't until it is given away. And I was like, isn't, I don't get it, I don't get it. And then I saw, oh, there was a very big statement of love written in all sorts of creative, artsy, flowery uh, lettering. And so it says love isn't love until it's given away. And, and normally, I am not a big fan of Christian cliche, like, hey, let's say this, let's put it up on our, our wall and thing, like, things like that. But this one, I was like, that's, that's, I believe that, like, that's, that's true. Like, you can't have love by itself, right? So, like, if I'm a loving guy, there has to be someone, something that I am loving, right? If we say God is love, which we do say in the Bible, 1 John 4.16, uh, this is totally out of context. Right, let me, so it's, uh, John is writing to the believers, saying that we should love one another. Why? Because God is love. If we have love, then we have God. But, but it's because the essence of our God is love, you could, you, could, you could make an argument that all the other characteristics that we talk about God, his righteousness, goodness, holiness, his, his mercy, his justice, stem from this love. That this is the key element of our God giving of himself. And of course, to be love, there has to be more than one. You can't just have a loving God. There has to be, if, if a God is love himself, he has to have an other to love. And so that's where the concept of a Trinitarian There's three persons, one unified whole, and they're held together by love is so important. That's the only way that we can have a God who actually 
is love, not is loving. So for us, our mission statement, to live God's love beyond ourselves. That's never going to happen by ourselves. There has to be an other. Whether that's here within the room, whether it's outside, we can never live God's love beyond ourselves without actually loving someone else. So first up, first step, first off, we can only reflect God's love in community. Absolutely. Like, you can't have it by yourself. You can't sit in a room and just really abound in God's love. You can feel his love as he loves you. You can love him back. But if we're going to live this love beyond ourselves, there has to be an other. It's not, it's not a, a single person, a one player mission that, that we're on here in the church. And now I want to get back to this whole Trinitarian perspective. Uh, many attempts, at least if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard many different analogies and illustrations about, uh, well, what is the Trinity like? And they never quite get it. They, like, they, if there is something in the world that is, oh, it's just like this, that it's not. So here's one that I've heard. Uh, an apple. An apple has seeds, it has the fruit, and it has the skin. So they're like three separate things, but they're all one. It's an apple. Uh, Yes, but there are, there are very significant differences between the seed and the skin. You know what I'm saying? Like, like when we're talking about the Trinity, we're saying they are the same and yet different. So like that one doesn't quite cut it. Or another one is um, uh, water, right? So this one tries to get at the same essence, right? So at different temperatures, water can be ice and it's crystalline form, solid. Uh, at another temperature, it can be liquid, you know, like drinking water. And then at a higher temperature, it's gas. It's, it's the same in essence, you know, but they're three separate things. Well, here's where it falls apart. Uh, you can never have all three at the same time. God does not shift. You know, now I'm God the Father. Now I'm Jesus. You know, now I'm the Holy Spirit. No, there are three separate, eternally existing persons. It's not like a state of matter that God just kind of keeps shifting on. So, so, like, that falls apart. Another one is like um, a prism. If you had three faces on one prism, and so it's like depending on how you look at it, then it's, it's, it's a different face. You know, but, but no, that's the same thing. It's like, no, there's three separate persons that are actually loving and interacting. Anything that we have that tries to grasp at this concept of a trinity, of who our God is in this world, uh, will fall short someplace or another. But there's a spot in the Bible that talks about where God has placed himself to be revealed in the world. There's this concept called the image of God, where he has placed his image here within the world, where we can see our God, somehow, in some way. And it pops up multiple different locations, but the very first time that we see this is in Genesis chapter 1, when God's creating the whole entire world. And then we get to verse 27, and it says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And we see right here, the, the first instance of this image of God. We see that this God that we can't comprehend. We don't know who he is. We can't understand all his characteristics, his Trinitarian aspect, his love. And yet he, he made, as a part of his creation, I want to reveal myself. I want to put my image in these humans. <laughs> now the image of God, there's so much debate on what is the essence of this image. Some people think it's our rationality. It's our ability to, to make decisions or progress, you know, discover things. You know, it sets us apart from birds or trees or some other aspect of God's creation. Uh, some people want to go down the line um, of it being more of the, the relational capacity that humans have. You know, our ability to love is this image of God within us. Uh, others take it a completely different direction, say it's not something inherent in us, but rather it's a task that we've been given. It's a responsibility that God has delegated to us. In the same way that God rules and creates in the world, he now places that image on humanity and says, you go rule and create. Because right after this verse, he does say, you have dominion over all the rest of the creation. We're supposed to take care of it. We're supposed to be uh, kind of the ones in charge. Um, others look um, more at what the word actually means and, and, and see uh, parallels with uh, statues that kings would set up in, in different places. They'd go conquer a nation, and then they'd set up statues of themselves to represent, you are under the rule of this king. So we are almost statues declaring that this is God's. And so we then represent God. Uh, there's, I would argue that there's no right answer. It's, it's all of those. It, it's all of those things make up the image of God. But here's what I want to propose today. What if we didn't grow up 
in such an individualistic society. See, when we see the image of God he created them, we hear, and the image of God he created each and every single one of us. But it says he created mankind in his own image. He created them. It even goes out to say male and female. One person cannot be both male and female. There's a joke in there somewhere, but I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. It's, it's intentionally telling us that there are differences and that it's within all of these differences together, there's an image of God. I wonder if we grew up in a non-individualistic society, we wouldn't try to figure out, well, how is the image of God in me? But rather we would see, how is the image of God in all of us together, mankind, all of us, perhaps self-giving love of each other, being separate individuals and yet a unified whole. This isn't so far out there. There, You can make arguments both ways, but in the New Testament, we see the image of God come back and we see humans have wrecked and ruined this image of God. We do not live in this, this proper way to correctly and accurately reflect God to the world, but Jesus Christ did. In Colossians, we have this. Colossians 1. I know I'm hopscotching all around here. Write down any sort of verses that you, that you want to follow up on. There's a lot of good content here, um, but we're kind of picking summary verses to, to uh, talk through these points. Um, this is a letter after Jesus came. He died. He resurrected. He ascended. The church is born, and now Paul is encouraging the church at Colossians, and he says this about Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So this passage is talking about elevating Christ. He is the one who, re- who accurately reflects God. He is the one that has created everything. He is right to be worshipped as God. But you know what's interesting to me is that it says he is the head of the body, the church. So we have Jesus Christ is the image of God, but now the physical representation, his body here on earth, is the church. Now, now I think it's significant. It does not say every believer is the body. It's every believer together in the church is the body, is the representation of this image of God. Christ is the head. It says this um, even, even more clear in Ephesians chapter 1 at the very end. Uh, it says that the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Like it, it is the church that now is, is the representation of Christ on earth together. Not, not just individually. I think... I've been taught, at least my whole life, that each one of us is being renewed to be like Christ. Yes, that is true. But it is all of us together that represents this image, this image of God to the world. So we can only reflect God's love within community. The image of God is only seen in community, or at least only completely seen within community. And last, if you want to see how significant community is in the Bible, you've got to recognize that God's mission is always within community. Always, always, always. If we say God's main characteristic is his love, this Trinitarian love, this self-giving love, eternally existing, uh, that question, the age-old question, why did God create the earth? You know, if he had everything, why would he do it? Well, out of his love, he wants to love, right? So he's creative, and he makes a thing, not just to have a thing and see what it looks like, but to have a relationship with that thing, to love that thing, because our God is love. He didn't just want to create and see what would happen or let humans just kind of do what they want. He wanted to create the world to love the world. And, and then, you know, we saw that he, he added uh, the image of God inside of his, his people. Adam and Eve uh, are the two representatives of all of humanity that comes, uh, that comes after them, including ourselves. And, and they choose to say, you know what, God, I'd rather do things my own way you know, it, it said God would, he would walk in the garden with them. He, he wanted to be with them. And they were like, eh, actually, I kind of, maybe I kind of like doing this thing by myself. There's lots to explore. You know, let, let me not treat you as God. Let me just kind of be in charge. And so he let them be in charge. And yet God didn't give up. God continually wanted. Here's, here's the mission that, that I wrote down as a summary 
of what I see God's movement throughout the Bible. This is God's mission. It's to dwell with the redeemed people who worship him as God. He started out with Adam and Eve and wanted to dwell with them as they worshiped him as God. When they chose not to worship him as God and rejected his presence with them, well, well, now humanity was corrupt. And so now God is on a mission to create a redeemed people. And you see this all throughout this, the text. I, we aren't going to go all these verses because I only got a certain amount of time every Sunday, but here we go. So we see hints of this with Abraham when he's called. Genesis chapter 12, God says, Abraham, you will be made into a nation. I will make you a people, and then through you, all nations will be blessed. And he, doesn't necessarily, he says he'll be with Abraham, but he doesn't necessarily ha- unveil entirely how is this going to work with the, this people. We fast forward a couple years, and in Exodus, the second chapter of the Bible, at the very beginning, he takes his people, which is now a large nation. They were enslaved in, in Egypt, and he says, they're mine. They're coming out. And, and against the, the power structures of the day, he completely wipes them aside, and out comes his people, He takes them to Mount Sinai and he makes a covenant with them. And he says, I will be your God. You will be my people and I will dwell with you. Now, I don't know if any of you guys read through the Bible in a year. If you're reading through the Bible through the year, uh, chronologically, not uh, chronologically, but uh, what, what would the adjective describe based on canonically? How they put together the Bible. So if you read uh, the, first chat, the first book first, second book second, you'd be just completed with the second book, Exodus. Uh, you'd probably be feeling... Should I really keep going? This is like the really dry section in the Bible, one of them. Uh, why? Because at the end of Exodus, so you get this cool narrative where he's like tossing Pharaoh to the side and doing all sorts of these plagues, and then his people come out, and then the miraculous parting of the sea. Well, now that they're in the desert, and he's making this covenant with them, there's all these very detailed instructions about a tent. It's like there's measurements and and weights and make sure it's made of this material and this long and then these people will set it up. These people will tear it down. And it's like, what is going on? Well, God is teaching them what the tabernacle is. That's where he's going to dwell. This almighty God with the people that are stained by their own sin and desire to go their own way, he's making a way to dwell with them as they worship him as God. In, in Leviticus, you're, you're reading there now, if, you, if you're going through it in a year, there's all sorts of sacrifices. they got to kill this animal. If they're poor, they got to use a dove. they got to sprinkle the blood on this. And then you're like, goodness, what is all this? God is creating a redeemed people, a people that can be cleansed from their sin and dwell with God. That's what God wants to do. Fast forward. I know, we got to keep going, keep going. There, I mean, there, there's so many I'm leaving out, too. You, you guys got to understand. But, but then um, eventually God, God takes his people and, and places them in the land that he has called for them, the promised land. And they, they kind of settle down, and then there's kings that are set up. And then under Sol- uh, David and then Solomon is completed is the temple, which is a representation of the tabernacle, where God's presence will dwell with his people as they worship him. And he has this whole sacrificial system that can enable them to be redeemed. Uh, the people don't do it very well. <laughs> uh, the, the story goes that they, they choose to reject God and, and not worship him, but they still keep the temple because they want to have God as his dwelling. And then in Ezekiel, it's very powerful. The prophet uh, Ezekiel sees God's presence literally lift up and leave. He just, I, I'm not dwelling with you if, if you are not my redeemed people who worship me. But God doesn't give up. He keeps going. So his, his people are exiled into a land. God doesn't forget about them, brings them back. And then ultimately, God comes to dwell with us. In John chapter 1, Jesus, God himself, makes his home. It, it, the, the word in, in Greek is tabernacle, right? He's, he's dwelling with us. And what is Jesus' mission? To redeem all the world, right? So, so he dies on the cross in order that our sins are paid for, so now we can have this access. God can dwell with us. This holy, perfect God can be with us. That's Jesus. And then, then he resurrects and he leaves, right? He ascends back to, back to heaven and sits on his throne at the right hand of God the Father. And, 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 but before he does, he says, you, disciples, my crew, my people that worship me as God, wait, because I'm going to send someone to you. What is that someone? It's his presence dwelling with them. And then we see in Acts chapter uh, 1 and 2, they gather together uh, at Pentecost. This is what we call it, is when the Holy Spirit fills them all. They preach, and, and people, uh, Peter actually makes a very individualistic sounding uh, request. says, repent and believe. And everyone who, who repents, believes, they're baptized, and then they're in. But then right after that, this is the very end of Acts chapter 2, 
it says that um, thousands were added to that number that day. And then it says, right after, it says the believers, this group, committed themselves to four things. One is the apostles' teaching, so they're going to hold on to the truth of what they've been learning. Uh, the last one that it mentions is prayer. They're going to hold on to God's presence within them. The other two, it's fellowship and breaking of bread. It's each other. They're going to hold on to each other. It's because we are all together God's community. And then the very end, where, where, is, where is God going in history? The last two chapters of the Bible in Revelation. We do not see every individual who is chosen to follow God get their own little uh, cloud that they get to play their harp on and God gets to visit them like every day. No such individual, individualized salvation here. What we see is a, a city that has been prepared for God come down from heaven, new heaven, new earth, where all of God's people will dwell. And it says specifically, God will dwell with them. And we see in multiple passages that we see him face to face. This is not um, the, the type of experience we have here. Rather, it's going to be a, a kind of a, a renewal of the Garden of Eden where we are living with him. He's walking among us. He is providing our life. And, and there's so much goodness that is happening. God ultimately will dwell with his redeemed people that worship him as God. This is God's mission all throughout the Bible. We here in our iteration of church are in the middle, right? So Jesus has come. He's died on the cross for our sins. Therefore, we can have God's presence with us in the Holy Spirit. We can have uh, God access to God through prayer. Uh, but we aren't there yet in this, this one day. God is going to establish this perfect rule where all of us are going to be together. All that to say, community is present Every single time we see God moving in the Bible, that is God's goal, is to create this community of people together. So we can only reflect God's love through community. The image of God is only completely seen within community, and God's mission is always in community. So when Paul says, this is Hebrews, we aren't, we aren't even jumping there, he says, don't, don't forsake the community, don't forsake meeting with each other. Like, that's a key element. Once, once you stop meeting with community, once you make this individualized, you're now uh, not expressing God's love. You're, you're removing yourself from declaring the image of God. You are uh, setting yourself uh, just to the side of where God's acting in the world. This, in community, is so important to our mission. It's, it's what I said at the beginning. Our mission is impossible without community. It's, it's in every aspect of what we do. So what does that look like? What, what is community, right? As of right now, it's some vague idea of there's multiple people involved and there's some sort of shared identity and who God is or something like that. Uh, what does it look like? Um, again, you could do a sermon series on community, but I, I want to just point out two different practical applications that I think apply to us right here, right now, in our iteration of community. The first one is if we're serious about the, the necessity of community, we will move toward our differences. We are created different. I, I think that in that image of God passage at the very beginning, uh, just by even saying male and female, he created them, he's saying that he did not use a cookie cutter. And we can look around and we can tell, like, we are not alike. But that's not bad. In fact, that is what expresses this image of God. These separate individuals that are somehow a unified whole. We should be doing this in the church, right, in ways that the world can only guess or is just befuddled. Like, how can people with such different views be coming together? So what does that look like? It looks like moving toward our differences. Now, these are the, the easy differences, right? So if uh, someone has a different size house than you, different background than you, uh, if someone's raising their hands worshiping and you'd rather have your hands in your pocket while you worship, if someone's uh, much more cerebral, someone's much more emotional, you know, there, there's a lot of different flavors of people, what we shouldn't do is, is the human nature thing and try to make everyone look alike or everyone view God alike or every, everyone worship God alike or everyone serve God alike or everyone um, talk to each other in the same manner. Because what expresses the image of God more fully is having everyone play their part. That's how the church was designed. This is what Paul says uh, in a letter to Ephesians. Chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. From him, this is Christ as the head, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows. You know what? I think I hit it twice. I was about to say, I'm like, I thought there was some background that came before this. 
All right, this feels right. All right, Ephesians 4, 50 through 16. Instead, speaking the truth in love. Yeah, here's where I wanted to start. So instead, he says, uh, we won't be tossed back and forth by the winds and the waves of every teaching. Uh, right? So, so as opposed to just kind of going with what everyone says and just kind of feeling that, we're going to be grounded. He says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Like sometimes shorthand for the church is the body. Have you ever heard that, right? Like we're the body, you know, or the body, you know, we're doing this. We're, we're Christ's body. Like it's, it's Jesus Christ's body here on earth. This is where it's coming from. From him, Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We are the ligaments within the body that hold everything together. How? Through our love. Builds itself up in love. That's what the church is supposed to look like. Each one of our parts. And if you look further in Ephesians 4, uh, back uh, before this, you see that, that God, uh, Paul specifically says God gives different people different gifts, and we're all supposed to build them up together in love in order to be this, this ligament, this body that holds together. So we aren't some Frankenstein, you know, body parts falling off. It, it, it's if it, we're all being ourselves, not the same, but all together in love. I think one of the other applications of this moving toward differences is, is an encouragement. If you feel different, if you engage with God in different ways, if you have different opinions about different things, say them. The church needs them. If, if you don't look like the pastor, you don't look like the person up on stage, you don't worship in the same way that the worship leaders do, stay and share how you worship. Share what you're going through. Share what your struggles are because they're different and we need you. It's someone on Facebook this past week, uh, they posted, um, they were collecting uh, spoons. Um, and I think, you know, it might be Disney. That's like two Disney references in one week, two weeks. Um, but they were, it was some sort of collector item spoons. You could only buy like six or eight of them. Uh, but there was like a total of six or eight in the set. But you couldn't pick which ones you get. You know, it's, um, or it's like in Monopoly. You ever play a game at McDonald's? If they ever did that again, I would. Um, but they don't. Uh, you don't get to pick like which little... Uh, you know, tokens you get, and then you try to, you know, swap them because you need the full set. It's like the church needs the full set. We don't need all of the same thing just repeated over and over and over, and yet that's what we tend to do as humans is try to make everyone look like us and follow the right way of doing it. No, 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 no. The right way is each one of us individually serving each other, building each other up in love, and that way we're a unified whole. That's how we demonstrate this trinitary nature of our God. That's how we display the image of God with the world. All right, here's another point. Communi- oh, did you read it? No, it's fine. <laughs> Community is not friendship. So he, he, here's what, no, I'm not saying we aren't friends. Like, I'm not saying that none of this is genuine. We should have friends at church. People do have friends at church. We met at church. You know, like there's, there is friendship in church, but community is not friendship. See, friendship says, uh, I have someone that I can turn to in times of need. Community says, I turn to someone in their time of need, right? Community is the giving side of friendship. Friendship is the receiving side of community. It's, it's the same coin, but what the Bible commands us to do is not enjoy friendship in church. It's be community. Serve one another in love. Uh, we see in, in Proverbs uh, a lot of the benefits of friendship. Uh, but in these letters to the New Testament church, you don't see Paul or anyone saying, uh, make sure you have friends at church, you know, and, and you'll be blessed because you will have friends. You'll have people to turn to. What he, he says over and over and over is love one another, serve one another, give yourself up for them. Here's uh, one example again. Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Uh, One of the pervading themes in this letter of Philippians is unity. This overall sense of unity in spite of our differences. Again, write that down. If you want to dig in further, there's about four references, maybe five, uh, of where we see Paul beseeching the church for unity. But here's what it looks like. Don't look towards your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's not friendship. It's not, oh, I, I get to go there and I get to uh, feel good about myself or someone's going to like me or there's, uh, they're going to care for me. They're going to ask me how I'm doing. They're going to support me. 
Our mindset for the church is rather, what are their needs? How can I serve them? If we're all doing that, guess what? There's, there's a lot of friendship too, right? Because if I'm offering you my community, you're receiving my friendship. And so then that becomes genuine as we're all trying to build each other up. Uh, another thing that that means is uh, expectations of, of us, us within the church. Uh, some people I've heard have said, Maybe they haven't articulated it, but there's an expectation that the church will provide them with friends. Like they they go back to church in order to have good friends, right? It's like, I want Christian friends. I want good peers. They can kind of hold me accountable. Therefore, I'll go to church. And so then they feel a little disappointed if for whatever reason they, you know, they didn't get invited to the community group or they didn't, you know, get um, invited out to lunch or something. It's like, oh, I just, I felt like there should be more friendship. Yes, there probably should be. But what's commanded, again, is not friendship. It's community. And that's on all of us to provide and create. Uh, another, another aspect of community not being friendship uh, means if you don't actually feel like emotionally connected to people, that's okay. You can still serve them. That doesn't disqualify you. It's not that we only serve the people that you know, we really like or only the people in our community group, only the people that are extroverted just like us or whatever it is. No, no, no. If there's someone that perhaps you don't have a lot in common. Perhaps all your conversations with them are super awkward. Or perhaps you just, uh, you, you're full on your capacity of friends. You can't have another friend. But you can still provide community. You can still love for the sake of them and for the sake of the image of God within the church. Just two little applications. There are so much more that we could do. Bottom line, oh, before the questions, whoa. the mission is impossible without community. We absolutely need to have it, and it's, it's commanded that we would be the ones providing this. But just think with me. What would it look like if we did this? All of us, individually, loved everyone that came in. We served them. We were confident in who we were, and we contributed to each other. Everyone else looked to what everyone else was contributing. They called it out within them. Uh, they enjoyed it. They, they were encouraged by it. Like Just think of the feeling. Like a new person walking in, they just see smiles. You know, they, they feel this warmth. There's, there's so much uh, life just kind of flowing through here. They, they see God at work. That's what God is doing within his church. That's his mission is to create these spaces that reflect who he is to the world. And that's us. That's where God is taking us here at this church. Here's three questions that you guys can talk, talk about today, talk about in your community groups at home, uh, try to take it a little one step further and then also apply it to yourself. Number one, uh, where have you experienced the most genuine love? Number two, uh, what is one way you might be wrong in your participation in community? That's a little more self-introspective question on that. And then three, how can you engage in biblical community? Maybe it's one of those two applications that I gave you, but there's so many other ones as well that you can consider in your own specific life or your own particular individual life? How do you participate in that community? And then when we participate in community, then we can be, uh, experience God and we can share God with the world. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, we love you. We thank you for your, your relentless pursuit of us and community that you want to dwell with us and, and no matter how much we uh, don't appreciate it, you, you continue to choose and work in ways in order to dwell with us. We want that to be true here in our church, Lord. I ask that, that our hearts would be turned toward you, that we would understand your love, that you would fill us with your strength and your patience and endurance in order to provide this love for each other. Show us those opportunities and fill us with your power in order to be able to take those opportunities, Lord, and express your love to each other in order that the whole world might know who you are so that you could get glory, God, so that people could say, yes, God is here, and it would be an accurate picture of you, God. We love you and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for sending your son, enabling us again to have that relationship with you. In your name we pray, amen.